This lecture is on persuasion. I really like talking about persuasion. I'm not that persuasive. And another guy that said the same thing is Robert Cialdini. He says, I always get persuaded. And he worked at ASU and he's since then retired. This is a national bestseller. He's written a lot of different things. Just a book called Persuasion, There's a, or Influence, sorry. There's another one called Presuasion, all kinds of books. You can go out there and look them up. Okay, so when I talk about persuasion, I usually set the table with this. Aristotle. Aristotle and rhetoric said there's three different things that make an attempt persuasive. What are they? Ethos. Who's saying it? Okay, if there's something wrong with my car, I'm going to trust the mechanic more than I'm going to trust my buddy, right? Because it seems like he has more credibility. We'll definitely talk about that today. The second thing is pathos, which is emotion. I work on emotion. I don't know how I'm doing this morning, but I like to be silly. But other times, you know, I can be whatever, you know, cry. You know how I am. And so I'm all over the place. But emotion to me is so important when it comes to delivering a message, because if it doesn't have emotion, people don't listen. Now, logos is what you probably should focus on, which is does it make sense i don't care who's saying it or if they have a lot of passion i just want to know if it makes sense okay so we'll come to this later on as well i'm going to argue a lot of times people don't don't pay attention to that one <laughs> and they sometimes don't pay attention to this one but maybe i'm biased but what i want to show is two different commercials i'll show a lot of ads later on that work on fear that's pathos but these work on humor so here they are That's my toy. Bad. What's wrong? Do you want a Dorito? That's mine. Oh. Here you go. Last one. Have a seat. Kyle, Jalen, Jalen, Kyle. Jalen, you play nice. I'll be right back. What's going on, little man? So you got your game skills down, Pack? You might have your hands full once I'll pick up the controller, little man. Put a bear. Keep your hands on my mama. Keep your hands on my Doritos. Jalen, are you playing nice? Okay, I hope you like those commercials as much as I did, but you can see the power of humor. Okay, another important factor is selective attention. That's why I'm talking about it all the time. What you focus on becomes important. Why? Because of the availability heuristic. If I just focus on the same information over and over and over, what do you think is going to pop in your head first, and what do you think you're going to assume is true? Okay, so let's look at the world. Normally, we get to focus on certain information, and so we kind of make the availability heuristic come true for ourselves. Because if I only focus on, let's say, these three things over and over and over, see, I only focus on those three things, it governs my reaction to the world. Pay attention, Tim. <laughs> okay, so let me get off of that piece. Now, when it comes to persuasion, though, there's a speaker there in the middle. He's pre-selecting certain information, just like me. Hey, guys, don't look at that. Look at these three pieces over and over and over. So in a way, he's shaping the availability heuristic for you. Now, I love 1984. You better thank your lucky stars. You don't have to read it, but I love it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, I don't know if I can show you this right here. Yeah, 6079, there's Winston Smith, tattooed right on my arm. My mom always freaks out about that. What does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? So in 1984, you're not supposed to think. And what does the Ministry of Truth do? It makes sure that that happens. So they rewrite history or they destroy history. And then they publish the news all day long on these television screens and therefore if they only focus on these three things and then they destroy and burn all this none of that ever really happened <laughs> this is why I like 1984 it's like oh it just never happens like yeah it did so we're not going to get into that too much but how does it relate to this class well what is the ministry of truth in our society 
I call it the media. I don't care if you listen to the uh, Republican news or the Democratic news. Why is the news Republican or Democratic? Because they want to only focus on certain pieces, and so they shape your mind availability heuristic style. So you don't have to think too much. I love this poster. Looks like you've had a bit too much to think. <laughs> the thought police, okay? And so instead of just calling it the media, maybe I could call it also the government. The government does the same thing. And this is why I mentioned this before. I love soldiers. Ask them what happened in the war and then watch the government, what they say, and also the media. Petty and Catchy Opo, that's how you say that name, in 1986 came out with this very influential model. I call it the elm. I just remember an elm tree. And so elaboration likelihood model. That's a mouthful. What does that mean? What it basically means is how much do you elaborate on a message? How, how much depth do you go into? What's the likelihood you'll really process it in a deep way and scrutinize the validity of the argument? Think about the election or think about when you're going to buy a new car or house. You do some deep processing sometimes. But then there's this other route, and they argue a lot of people take this route right here, the peripheral route, and a lot of advertising works on this. What is that? Shallow processing. I'm just going to, I don't know, everybody else buys that one. I'm not going to think about it too deep. Or, it looks really cool. Or, I don't know, LeBron James drinks Sprite. <laughs> That's why I love the Sprite commercial when he says, don't drink Sprite because I drink it, right? He's making fun of the peripheral route. Okay, so I have a bunch of advertising where I kind of show the difference between these two and it's kind of silly and I could go out and get a lot more of this, but this is where I wish we were in class and had more time. Okay, so advertising. Okay, so Subaru does a lot of the central route. They want to show you how much ground clearance they have, the roof rails, more leg room, cubic feet, all this, you know, how, what's the miles per gallon, all these different things. So they are trying to be central. Volvo also does this because they've always like been the hallmark of safety. So they want you to focus in on this and read all this stuff and look at the construction of the car and things like that. So that is central advertising for cars. But a lot of times, like, I might not be persuaded about that. I mean, I just like the way that looks. It's fucking dope. You don't have to tell me a fucking thing about it. You know what I mean? I, yes, please. You, I don't know. And other advertising, I think, I have this one on here is very silly. I mean, what does that have to do with, like, is the car good or not? You know what I mean? So humor or just slickness, right, sometimes guide us more towards a purchase then we're going to scrutinize the validity of the argument. Okay, so let me see what I have on here. Oh, yeah, <laughs> whiskey. Now, sometimes, like with cigars and everything else, they try to, you know, get experts and show. <clears throat> There's a quantitative ranking, and ours tastes the best, and it has hints of vanilla, and let, all this bullshit. I don't understand, you know what I mean? But I could just show my alcohol like this. Sex sells. Sex is also pathos, right? We're fixing to get into the whole sex sells here in a second. Okay, so this is for this watch. Let me tell you right now, Tim's not going to read all that shit right there about how great your watch is. But see, certain brands, and this is why I like branding if you're into uh, marketing and stuff. Bulgari doesn't have to do anything. It's like, fuck you, we're Bulgari. If you want one, you can have one, but you're going to have to pay. Prada's like this, too. There are certain products. Rolls-Royce doesn't have to advertise. They're just the shit, right? They've achieved brand, uh, this like brand recognition that's so high that they don't have to be central anymore. Okay, so this is for some kind of... Uh, you know, beauty product, and you're supposed to read about how this stuff is great for your face and to use on and blah, blah, blah. Or I could just be like Clinique. I mean, they're just like, oh, butterfly. I'm a butterfly and soft and pretty. You know what I'm talking about? So it doesn't say anything about their makeup and how good it is or anything over there. It just has, you know, this kind of pathos i would argue that's a pathos element because it's not logos and it's not ethos who's saying it this is like here's the product and we're just going to show some nice pretty pictures along with it
this is for a condom. This is kind of controversial because it's plan B, <coughs> excuse me, the day after pill. And so you can read all this stuff. And I actually used to have an ad where it was like a whole page where you had to read the whole thing or have this one for contraception, which I use in my gender class. I mean, what's that all about? The reason I use it in my gender class is because we talk about, well, why wouldn't they just put her head on there? Because, you know, they don't want her to have a head. And that's called dismemberment. <laughs> Sorry, I'm coughing so much. Here's like, maybe it's the appropriate time. Here's the cigarette commercial. Back in the day, you know, Marlboro Man, this thing, you know, that they made it all cool to, you know, smoke cigarettes. And I think this is why I included this on here. I love these commercials where doctors recommend different cigarettes. Here's this doctor right here. And I think I have two more. It's like, give your, uh, smoke a fresh cigarette. This is what the doctors say to smoke camels. I mean, that's rough as hell. Our lucky strikes. I mean, those are rough as hell too. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed those few things. But basically, these are trying to be central right here. But I argue a lot of ads tend towards the peripheral. Okay, the next group of people I want to talk about is the Yale group. The Yale group were a group of psychologists from America, led by this guy, Carl Hovland. You don't have to remember his name. But what they wanted to do is build morale over here. Because what was happening is in Nazi Germany, you had Joseph Goebbels and Lenny Riefenstahl and all these other people that were developing media to manipulate the German people. I think Goebbels said, think of the press as like a giant typewriter that you can manipulate people with. But anyway, these guys came here to try to build American morale. I think I have, yes, here he is, Goebbels right here. He was in charge of all the Nazi propaganda, kind of like this, where you, you know, it's working on passion, these kinds of ads. I think I have some other ones. Rosie the Riveter is the best for us, right? And she's a fucking badass. But I love this one right here. When they were trying to ration gas and stuff, if you drove around your car alone, it's like you're riding with Hitler. It's like so funny. But these ads kind of are working again on pathos, which is a peripheral route, not necessarily central. Some of it could be central. Well, I love these this weird German one. It's just kind of off-putting. It's like, oh, you know what I mean? Here, let me give to the Nazi party. But these, like, buy war bonds, you know, here come the Germans to destroy our American way of life. So a lot of times in times of war or in politics, you know, we work on fear, you know, our patriots. So, okay, so the Yale group came up with these four factors that affect persuasion. So they have four, okay? So source, who says it? Medium, how does it come across? Like, I'm coming across on the internet to you message what's being said isn't this the most important thing the only central one tear apart that and scrutinize that and recipient what are other people doing we'll barely talk about that one okay so we, before we get into um these and i'm going to break you know this into a second half as well but i want to briefly say something about the medium the medium is how does it come to you you know, we don't read, you know, maybe newspapers as much anymore, but, you know, do you get it on your iPhone, through the Internet, do you hear it on TV, through radio, whatever. And certain mediums are more effective than other ones. Now, if I look at it this way, the more lifelike a medium, and now we're in the cyber age, the better, right? That's why I'd rather be in person. But at least if I'm videotaped, I'm pretty close. But if you were in person with me, I think I'm more effective. And that's what researchers say, you know. So as your medium gets more lifelike, it becomes more persuasive. I think a lot of that is pathos because it seems like you have robustness to your message. Now, the other thing I have on here is, is it spoken versus written? Now... There have been a little research on this because of this written thing right here versus spoken would be up in here. And Chaikin and Eagley says sometimes you would prefer it to be written. Most of the time you like lifelike, but sometimes you want it written. And that's when the message is really difficult. 
my example is, do you want your realtor to go through that 100 page document and read it to you in a lifelike manner? Or would you rather just say, hey, give it to me and I'll peruse it at my own <laughs> rate. And if I want to read it, I'll read it. And if I don't, I at least have the document to go back to. And so they found that, you know, sometimes there's an exception to that rule about being more lifelike. And that's when something's very complicated. You'd rather have written documentation that you could go through on your own. One of the most important factors that the uh, Yale group studied is the source. Who's saying it has a lot of weight. And so that goes back to ethos from Aristotle that we talked about earlier. Okay, so the source, I think I have five factors that make the source more um, persuasive according to the Yale group. And number one is credibility or believability. How believable are you? And that goes right along with trust. Can I trust you? Certain people's word is bond, right? And so when we talk about believability, this ties right into something which is expertise. I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to trust my prostate to my doctor who's done 400 surgeries. You know, I'm not going to go talk to somebody that doesn't have a lot of expertise with regards to that. Or when it comes to computer, you might trust a techie over yourself because they have a lot more knowledge of hardware and software. Or maybe I'll trust my mechanic more than me on my car. They know what's going wrong more than I do. So that's expertise. Now, I think I have this guy on here as an example. That's why they roll out Fauci, right? Because when they roll out Dr. Fauci, he's a doctor, Dr. Fauci, but he's supposed to have credibility, believability, because he's an expert. Okay, as far as your Beehive project goes, I'm going to go off on a tangent for a minute. Okay, so if you pick this particular thing for the project, Charismatic Leader, which a lot of you should pick because if you're picking a cult, for instance, or even gangs to a certain degree, there's usually a leader that's in charge. And so I want to just talk about how charismatic leaders uh, tie into the hive. Okay, charismatic leaders. Here's Jim Jones, here's David Koresh, here's Charlie Manson, and here's Marshall Applewhite. These are all charismatic leaders that control the hive. Now, how do they control the hive? Well, one of the things that cult leaders will do is usually set themselves up as an ultimate authority figure, kind of like the king or dictator or god. If you get into cults like I do, you'll see this all the time. They're usually deifying themselves. And so in this way, they're um, in charge. Everything you know that they say goes. Okay, so they claim to be deities. If you can see this, David Koresh says this. If the Bible is true, then I am Christ. It's like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. <laughs> Jim Jones right here claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus. So you'll see this quite often where not only are these, these kings, but they've also made themselves into these deities. Now, the other thing cult leaders are good at is picking followers. Not just everybody is going to go along with Marshall Applewhite and believe that Jesus is driving a spaceship behind the Hellbop comment, but we got to kill ourselves so that we can board the spaceship. You are strategic about the people that you pick. And so even Jim Jones would sit out on the sidewalk and just get passersby to help him fold letters. Not everybody's going to fold a letter, but people that come from broken homes, families that are thirsty. We haven't got into the old girl, he too thirsty lecture, but people that are really craving that family. What do you think gangs do? They don't pick people from healthy families. They pick people that want a family. And so authoritarian personalities are people that like to be told what to do and they like to follow orders. This is why I couldn't go into the military because <laughs> I'm like, what? Well, why do we have to do it? It's like, Tim, shut up and just do it. And so if you're not an authoritarian personality, don't go into the military, right? But in this way, if they pick these people that are authoritarian and like to follow orders, then it's a lot easier for them to shape the social reality. The second one is Tim's favorite, which is attractiveness. Attractive people are more persuasive. Nobody's more persuaded by a pretty girl than Tim. But anyway, they've done these crazy studies. I think they were back in the 70s. But what they would do is put someone on the side of the road and they would be broken down. Now, passersby are going by on the one-on-one. Are you going to stop? 
Now somebody like her is on the side of the road and somebody like me, <laughs> you know what I mean? And all they do is see how many cars stop. And a lot more cars stop for a pretty girl than they do for an average looking guy. And so they've done all kinds of different studies where who do you help and attractive people get helped more often, but that's helping, but they're also more persuasive. That's why they're in ads. Think about this. Brand recognition. What does this have to do with Chanel number five? I don't know. I love Nicole Kidman. I'm not kidding either. But uh, there's some branding that goes on with Chanel number five. They don't have to talk about their product, but that's all peripheral. It's just like, okay, pretty girl product, hot dude product, David Beckham product or this is the new samsung computers like i could get them from my gender class about whatever what's that all about okay i mean there's a little bit about it down here but i'm not reading that that's the central part there's the peripheral part right there same thing with gucci guilty it's like okay i guess with perfume you don't have to say what it smells like but still it's sex sales right sex sales or does it I don't know, to be fair to uh, the women or people that love dudes, here you go. Do you want to find some Italian dressing? <laughs> so on the very next slide, I have one of my all-time favorite commercials because it's exactly how Tim acts in the presence of a pretty lady. Che cosa guardi, eh? Che cosa guardi? Mi stai spogliando con gli occhi? Poverino. Non puoi farne a meno. Ti batte il cuore. Ti gira la testa. Sei perso pensando che sarò tua per sempre. The Fiat 500 Abarth. You'll never forget the first time you see one. Numbers three, four, and five are very easy. Number three is rate of speech, which doesn't bode well for Tim. The faster your rate of speech, the more persuasive you are. And so I think I have John F. Kennedy on here. Supposedly he could speak at 300 words per minute. I mean, he would just knock it off right he's like just rattling it off but he's from the northeast you know and i'm from the south so there's another thing why do we think people with british accents are smart and people that have southern accents are stupid <laughs> it doesn't matter i don't know if you know the newscaster dan rather but dan rather had a southern accent and he had to go to school to get rid of it because people said you can't be a newscaster because people will think you're stupid so that's why i said it doesn't bode well for me because it's fast talking but also in a certain dialect i think too that those dialects like british dialects we see as more intelligent than others maybe that's because of the king's english Okay, so I have this little quote from my hero right here. Conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth. Now, intent to persuade. This is why I hate the hard sell. Don't fucking, as soon as I walk into your store, it's like, do you need any help? There's certain stores that are like that. It's like, get the fuck away from me. No, I don't need any help. And I will spend money at your store if you lay off a, a player. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so reactance is this thing of this built-in tendency we have and if you have teenagers you know what i'm talking about if you feel you're being told what to do you're just like oh fuck that shit i'm not going to be told what to do don't get me on my rage against the machine right now it's like i'm not going to work on maggie's farm no more <laughs> you know what i mean so this intent to persuade becomes huge and that's why i think the soft sell works you know just let people come in if they want to buy some buy some if not whatever but when you start hammering on people i think reactance comes up and it's like uh, -uh i don't want to buy or uh, i don't want to vote for you buy whatever you're selling go away <clears throat> number five similarity birds of a feather flock together this might be one of the most important ones but it's the easiest to understand if someone is like you the same kind of bee you're more persuaded by them than someone that's real different 
I mean, if you're right-wing conservative, you're not going to be listening to a left-wing hippie and what they have to say. You know what I mean? And so this is why political candidates are great at this. They try to make themselves appear similar to you. They're supposed to be representatives, even though they don't always look like us, right? And so they want to, if they're going to a certain crowd of people, they might dress down, wear some jeans, right, to fit in. Or another crowd of people, they might dress up, have a tuxedo on, so they seem refined. And so the other kind of people that do this try to make themselves similar as a persuasive technique or salesman. Hey, buddy. Oh, I like hiking, too. Yeah, it's like this, that, and other. And so if they can relate to you, that's one of these factors that Robert Cialdini looked into. The more similar a person is to you, the more persuasive they are. Okay, I hope y'all are still with me. I'm getting kind of tired, but we're almost done. Then I'm going to stop and have persuasion part two, where I'm gonna finish up with the Yale group and do a few other things. Okay, the message. The message is the most important thing. What's being said? Does it make sense or not make sense? I don't care who's saying it, or if it comes to the newspaper, if you scribble it on a piece of paper, or I hear it on the radio or see it on TV, what's the truth? Now, when it comes to this, there are five different components of the message. I'm just going to do three of them and save the other two for persuasion part two. But number of arguments, how much evidence do you have? This relates to logos. That's why I like this one is the most important. If you have a lot of evidence to support your claim, that should be better than a little evidence. Think about your English class. Do you have a lot of citations or just one? What is your English teacher going to like? But he or she's not going to like a thousand, maybe. You know, there's a trade-off. But I call it convergent validity because if you have one study or piece of evidence that says A is true, eh, could be a fluke. But if you have 500 studies that says A is true, that's what convergent validity is. A lot of evidence is converging on the truth. Now, the second factor relates to the first factor quality of these arguments. You could have 87 references, but then you can't talk about it, every one in a lot of depth. I talk about this with students a lot of times. They, they cite too many things. It's like, no, how about just pick one or two really good citations and go into a lot of depth? And so you could have a uh, quantity quality trade-off and you can go into the literature. There's a lot of literature about this. The last one I'm gonna mention, for this time is one-sided versus two-sided arguments. So you give both sides of the story or not. That's why I have this little thing down here. And so I'm gonna argue you probably should give both sides of the story, but it's how you give both sides of the story. Think about a lawyer, okay? So should a lawyer say, if you're the prosecution, what the defense is gonna do, or just, just show his side of the story? You probably want to beat him to the punch. I'm getting older, but O.J. Simpson, if the gloves don't fit, you must acquit, right? And so it depends on your audience, too, your jury over here. Are they informed about the issue, interested, educated? I mean, sometimes you can be one-sided with an uneducated audience or an uninformed audience. You can only tell one side of the story. Well, I tell the other side of the story if they don't know it, but most of the time they know it. Now, I am older, like I mentioned, but I love this movie right here, A Few Good Men. I was just watching it last night. And in the movie, Tom Cruise is this lawyer, and uh, Kevin Bacon knows that Tom Cruise is going to use Code Red as a part of the defense. So what does he do? In his opening statement, Kevin Bacon gets up here and says, You're going to hear him talk about Code Reds, but... So see, he tells both sides of the story, but then he gives an alternative of why that's a bullshit story. And so lawyers are great at this. And it's called stealing somebody's thunder. Okay, I'll tell you who else is great at it. They're called politicians. <laughs> politicians know what the other side is going to say. I don't care if you're Trump or Biden. Biden's going to say, well, Trump's going to say this. And Trump's going to say, well, Biden's going to say that in this upcoming election. But it doesn't matter. That's why I think politics is a horse and pony show. Now, you can get real dogmatic. Let's say if you're at a rally of just your supporters, you can just tell your side of the story, but you're probably still going to go two-sided because you're still going to hate on the other side. 
Okay, that's all for today. I'll see y'all next time for Persuasion Part 2.